Here in Camera Basics, we're gonna look at a few simple things, but also a few important things. We'll talk for just a quick minute about what type of camera and the sensor in it. Then we're gonna look at the primary controls and the file format, one of the most important settings you can make on the camera. So this is a mirrorless camera. We've been working with these cameras for a number of years now. We have interchangeable lenses. Each of these lenses has a aperture in it that can control the light. It's our first way of controlling the light. So this is a opening that has various sizes. These are the standard f-stops. And as you go from one size to the next, you're either doubling or cutting in half the amount of light. The other effect of this aperture is that it also controls your depth of field. So a lens with a fast aperture of 1.4 will have a very shallow depth of field. And as you close that aperture down, you're gonna get more depth of field with each of those aperture settings. Once you get all the way down to the F16 and F22 range and sometimes beyond, you're gonna end up with the most amount of depth of field that you'll get for that particular lens. Each lens is a little different in the amount of depth of field that it will have. The next path that that light takes is getting back to the image sensor, but before it gets back there, it needs to get past the shutter unit, which has a first curtain and a second curtain. Now with a mirrorless camera, it needs to stay open so that it can send information to the LCD screen on the back of the camera and the electronic viewfinder so you can see and compose your image. When it comes time to take a photograph, we're gonna to need to do a couple of movements with the shutter unit. What it's going to do, and I'll show you from the side as well as in front, is it needs to close the shutter to prepare the sensor for gathering light. It then opens up, gathers the light, and then closes it. And then reopens again so that you can see the image for the next shot. Now this is the standard mechanical operation, and as I will explain in the upcoming sections, there are some choices that you can make here. So the shutter speed is another great way of controlling the amount of light as well as freezing motion. And so you can choose a variety of different shutter speeds for different effects and different environments. So these are your basics of the mirrorless camera. One of the most important components in any camera is the sensor. And in special note is the size of the sensor. And this camera uses a rather large size sensor. It's a large common size and it is based off of 35 millimeter film, which for many years was kind of the Goldilocks perfect sized film where you could have small cameras, but reasonably sized enlargements. There are a variety of other sensors out there on the market today. This one is known as full frame, has a crop factor of 1.0 because it's the same as 35 millimeter. Other cameras uh, from Canon and other manufacturers will have smaller size sensors in some cases. All right, let's talk about our basic controls on the camera. When you flip the camera on, the camera goes through a automatic sensor cleaning, it tries to shake off any dust that might be on the sensor. Uh, this would come forth in any photographs of light areas, of sky, white walls, for instance. You would see black specks where you might have a dust speck on the sensor. Now, generally speaking, these self-cleaning sensor units do a pretty good job and they're gonna kinda of keep your camera free most of the time of most of the problems. However, things do get stuck on it, and I will be talking later in this class about how to manually clean the sensor yourself if you're one that is willing to go down that road. You can also turn this feature on and off within the setup menu, but you can also do it just by turning the camera on and off. We'll talk more about the shutter release. That's pretty obviously important. The main dial is this forward dial on the camera. We have a quick control dial on the back of the camera, and we have a quick control dial too. Now, I generally, as a standard practice, like to call the dials exactly what the camera company calls it. That way, if you look up in the instruction manual, you've heard that term several times before. But I do not like the name quick control dial two. Um, and quick control dial one, that's just really the back dial. And so if I happen to say back dial in the class, that's that little dial, you know, right here on the back of the camera. Um, and this one around the mode button, well, that may be the mode dial. Is that, is that hopefully obvious? And then the front dial up here in front, the main dial, front main dial. And so if I use a different term, I apologize, but I think they should have named those a little bit more logically. Uh, in any case, uh, many other lenses also have control rings. This is one of the new features of the RF lenses is that you'll have a focus ring and 
if it's the zoom lens, it'll have a zoom ring. Uh, but in the front of the camera, you'll have this control ring that you can use for setting a variety of things. And we're gonna talk about customizing that. Well, that's way deep in the class. That's like section 18, I believe. Uh, we'll be going through and customizing that ring to do some very cool things. All right, the multi-controller. I'll probably call this the joystick, but the multi-controller is used for moving the focusing point around and navigating the menu systems and pretty much navigating anytime you need to go up, down, left, and right. And you can also press straight in on it. Uh, and that'll get your center, uh, your focus point to the center as well as confirming certain types of operations. The set button, like an OK button or a confirm or an enter button, we'll be using this when we highlight a particular feature we want and we want to confirm that as our particular setting. Now the camera also has a touch screen and there's a lot of these controls that you can just do on the screen itself. And as we go through the class, I'll be highlighting areas where the touch screen uh, is a very good tool to use or offers unique advantages over using the actual buttons on the camera. Now that shutter release we talked about, this is uh, got a lot of things going on when you press halfway down. It starts the metering system, it starts the autofocus system. If the camera was asleep, and the cameras do tend to go asleep because they're trying to conserve on battery power. And bat not gonna shoot pictures without a battery, so the camera tries to be as conservative as it can by shutting down and the half press will just wake the camera up and get it ready. And anytime you get lost in the menu system and you're trying to back out and do I hit cancel or do I go left or what do I do? If you just wanna get out, just press halfway down on the shutter release, immediately puts you back in the shooting mode, exits you out of the menu system. Press all the way down for taking photos, obviously. All right, a button that we're gonna talk a lot about in this class is the multi-function button up towards the front of the camera. This is a button that obviously controls multiple functions. Now there's a lot of different ways to program this and I'm gonna talk about some very innovative ways to reprogram this uh, later on when we get to the custom settings in the class. But it's a button that we're gonna be coming back to on a regular basis. Right now, Canon has put in five of what they think are the most important functions that you can use. So what you would do is you press the multi-function button and then you can turn that mode dial for choosing which function you want. You can also turn the back dial on there as well. And then when you wanna adjust that setting, you turn that front dial on the camera, the main dial for choosing a different mode. And so uh, for a lot of longtime Canon users like myself, there used to be an ISO button on the top of the camera. You just simply press that, turn the dial and change your ISO and that was great. And that's kind of the way that you can leave this set up. If ISO is the one thing that you change all the time, you hit that button, turn the dial, and you make your change, and only every once in a while do you change the other ones, you can go to that. But these are customizable, and I'll talk more about that as we get later in the class. If you do want to dive ahead, well, you can jump into custom function number three, customize your buttons, look for the M function button, and then you can go through and choose different options for it. There's lots of great options we'll be talking about in more depth. All right, file format. When you record images with a digital camera, they get stored on a memory card with a particular type of format. Now, one option, maybe the best option, is the raw format. This is the original information off the sensor, and it's getting you all the megapixels and all the tonal range that your camera can possibly capture. This is gonna give you the most latitude for working with a particular image later on down the road. And this is gonna be uh, a great system for anyone who is very serious about their photography and wants to be able to retain the highest quality images that they possibly can. So you're gonna to wanna to shoot RAW. A couple versions of RAW I'll talk about in a moment. Now, JPEGs are the most common type of format that are accepted on virtually every electronic device today. Now, one of the nice things about JPEGs is that they're smaller in size. The downside is how they do that is they compress the file and they throw away a lot of highlight and shadow information and color information that we might need if we're gonna enlarge, if we're gonna print, if we're gonna change the exposure on our pictures after we've taken them. And so it's very practical, but it has limitations. And so you gotta be careful and be very aware of when you're shooting JPEG and that it fits the need that you have. Now this camera offers a new feature. It's a Hyf file. And so this one is a new and improved version of the JPEG. The JPEG has been around for, well, a couple of decades at this point. 
and is an 8-bit image. This new Hive is a 10-bit image, and that offers greater tonal range in there. And so they could have made it a lot smaller in size, but it's actually about the same size as a JPEG, but it, it contains more information about the exposure. It's a better image than a JPEG image. The problem at the time of this recording is that not everything works well with these HIF images. And so it's one of these things where I'm not really sure if I wanna push people to it because it, it's better, but what if it gets abandoned like Betamax or something else like that? And so I don't, I don't know where it's going. I don't know what exactly is gonna to happen to it. And so right now I'm a little bit more cautious. I'd probably shoot raw or JPEG. Uh, check your workflow, see what works for you. In order to get there, you'll notice that when you dive into the menu, which we'll do here in just a moment, it doesn't just say Hive as an option on there. You actually have to go into shooting menu number two, go to HDR PQ settings and turn that feature on. I'll talk about more of that when we get to section 12 in the menu. Um, but that allows you to shoot Hive instead of JPEG. And you can't shoot JPEG and Hive at the same time. That's not a thing. But when you go into shoot menu number one under image quality, this is where you get to the full collection of options. Let's go through what these are. First off, the full RAW. This is kind of the standard RAW image that Canon's been shooting for a while. It's actually in a CR3 format now. Um, 45 megapixels, full resolution, full dynamic range. It's a great file if you wanna contain the most amount of information. Next up is a compact RAW file. And this is where I usually say, put on the brakes, hold on. What do you mean it's a compact RAW? I thought RAW was keeping all the information. I don't want second rate images. I want the full thing, give me the RAW. And now we've got this compact one. And I read up about it. And then I decided, well, okay, I need to do some of my own tests. And so I went out and I did some tests. I'm gonna show you those results in section 12. Yeah, section 12 and to show you what I did, because I did some kind of extensive things. I was overexposing by four stops and underexposing and trying to rescue the shadows and so forth. Uh, the short story for right now is that Compact Raw is awesome. It does a really, really good job, and that's where I shoot my camera most of the time. But we'll talk more about that later on in section 12. All right, next up, we have a bunch of JPEG options. So we have different file sizes for the JPEGs based on compression. So we have a kind of a full compression and um, a low compression option here, which is gonna result in different file sizes according to what your needs are. We have large, medium, and small, which has to do with the resolution. And if you shoot a RAW, you can make a JPEG, you can make a JPEG of any size you want. So if you start with RAW, you can always make something smaller. Having said that, there is a time and place for shooting JPEGs. If you are going to sell an item online and you need to take a picture of this thing and you're gonna put it online, you don't need 45 megapixels to show this particular pro uh, subject. You could probably shoot a small uh, JPEG if you want. And so you can choose an appropriate size JPEG that is appropriate to the needs that you're going to do. Uh, I know that I've shot for a uh, high school sports team before and I knew how the photos got used in slideshows and we made some small five by sevens and there was sports, so I was shooting thousands of photos at a time. I wasn't shooting raw, I was shooting JPEG for that. I kind of had my exposures nailed down. I could have the camera shoot really quickly. And so there's a time and place for raw and JPEG and you'll be the best judge as to what works for you. But I encourage you to shoot raw for all the important things. That way it gives you the most latitude later on. All right, so we've got you covered on the basics for the camera. It's time to start getting into the serious sections. So the next three sections are gonna be really big. We're gonna be talking about exposure, focus, and the drive settings. And these are the main controls of the camera. So uh, take, a, take a little break, get ready for these next sections because they're gonna be important ones.